testing, testing. So we're gonna go ahead and um we're gonna go ahead and start with the libation. If you could, it's a very intimate crowd today. You know what I'm saying? If y'all wanna come up a little bit closer to make it, you know, if you would like to come up a little closer, make it a little everybody won't be stretched out so much. Thought I had my regular libation crew not here today. All right, and if you could stand, stand while we do libation. Start off by pouring libations to the universal mother, father, creator, we all say, Ashe. We pour libation to those directly in our bloodlines. Say Larry McDaniel, another. Lisa Wright, Charles Reno, another. Your. Anybody want to shout out there? Fam any family members? Ashe. 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 We pour libation to those heroes and sheroes. I'd like to start with the Reverend Nat Turner. Ashe. Ashe. Brother Malcolm X. Ashe. Ashe, Khalid Muhammad, Ashe, Dr. Barashango, Ashe, Del Jones, Ashe, Ashe, Dr. Newton, Ashe, Ashe, Rough Mike, Ashe, Ashe, Madam Walker, Ashe, Ashe, Amos Wilson, Ashe, 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 Ashe. We pull our basin back to the universal mother, father, creator. We all say, Ashe, 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 yo. Continue standing while we do the African pledge. Put your black, strong, black power fist in the air. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to my people, the African race, the original man and woman of the earth, and the founders of civilization. I pledge to continue to struggle which will help to bring my beloved brothers and sisters to total freedom. I pledge to study and discipline myself mentally, physically, and spiritually so that I may grow into a soldier for justice. I pledge to live my life standing tall for a person on his or her knees is not respected. But if I'm challenged, that I must say that I will not surrender my position, nor my dignity, but instead, but instead, but instead, we shall endure until the final victory is won. Ashe, Ashe, give yourselves a round of applause. Y'all may be seated, thank you. And we won't hold the time up, but this was a very, important event that we wanted to do this and you know it's an intimate setting here today um some we got the flyers out late but if this day was just centered around having brother professor james smalls to go and visit my mom in the hospital and the and the smile that he put on her face was worth everything that, that, that the day counted for the smile that mom had on her face and anybody knows that almost 30 days ago mom had a stroke and so that's been a hectic change my life type of 30 days. And it's been ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. And Professor Smalls has been one of those people in my corner the whole time talking to him. How's your mind? Hey, look, give your mom positive energy. Don't give up on your mom. Don't give up, you know, because when you see that, like right then and there, you're kind of looking like, man, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. It's looking bad. It's looking bad. You know what I mean? And, you know, you kind of going up and down and he like, hey. You got to talk positive to your mother. You got to talk positive. Give her strength. Give her energy. And it's been those elders and people in the community that's been calling me every single day. And I appreciate every last one of y'all and all your prayers. Mom is progressing. I took my daughter, there, um, Kamaria, there today. And I didn't tell her that she was doing some things because last time she saw her, she was in ICU and not responding. 
And she didn't know what she was walking into the day. She thought that's that that's what she was walking into. And when she got in there, she saw her eyes open. She saw her wave at her. She saw her smile at her. And she was pointing at her. And she was like, oh, my God. She's doing it. You know I me. Mean? So, you know. So if today was to put a smile on mom's face with Brother Small was to come in there, we appreciate that. And, it, you know, it was, it was it, that was beautiful. So, I you know, I, I, I smiled when mom smiled. And she... um. She's been doing some things and, you know, so we're we, we happy about that. So give her a big round of applause. Just, you know, she'll, she'll see this. She's going to see this and she's going to hear this, you know. So, um, you know, and that's what this that's what this thing is about. It's December. Uh, you know, we're going into a, a new year coming up. And um, like I said, I'm just thankful that my mom's, you know, I mean, just just she 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 fought from the beginning. You know, what I mean, and those that don't know when it was happening. Mom, she knew what she she knew was something was going on. And the last person that was in her phone, what she did was she knew because her husband had got has Alzheimer's, so he doesn't know how to work phones or anything. So she knew that she had to get this phone call off. And she got the phone off to the last person that was in her phone, just left her house 15 minutes before. And you know, she got that phone call off. I need some help. I need some help. Something is happening, something is going on. Please call 911. You know what I mean? And so she got her to call 911. The lady came back. And so she gave herself a fighting chance from the start because my sister wouldn't have got home to two or three hours later. That, you know, what I mean, that night had she not gotten that phone call off, you know, so that was a, she gave herself a fighting chance and she's been fighting, fighting through, you know, what I'm saying. And uh, like I said, I do appreciate the elders in the community for, you know, for, for all that they do. You know, what I mean, so Brother Smalls has been coming here to Tupman City for us for the past um, 20 years. Um, he's been coming whenever I needed him. You know, we, we call. And he's here for the most part. Tried to get him the twenty first. It was my mom's birthday on the twenty first on a Saturday, so she wanted him to come around that time. See if you can get him to come during that time. But his birthday is the next day, so he said I can't come that day because my birthday is the, right the next day. So she wanted him to come. So like I said, she was excited about him coming, you know, back to town again. But he's coming. He's done all kinds of lectures and, um, you know, and and been one of the spiritual god guys in my life, and we really appreciate and for the community. So we really appreciate this brother, the scholarship. He's been with Dr. Ben. He's been with Dr. Clark. Um, he's going to share with you some stuff about some things about Dr. J, Dr. Jeffries, who's going through some health challenges right now. And we may have to help him out with some things, but he's going to share with you some updates on that or what's going on. But just in general, what's going on in our community. So I love this brother. He's a scholar, teacher all over the Internet, everywhere. And, you know, just love him. So let's give a big round of applause to Professor James Smalls. Big round of applause. Hotel. So um, I'm walking slow. That's the new me. Now they can do wonderful things with technology, right? So they took the one my mother gave me, threw that in the garbage because it wasn't working anymore. And then they put this plastic metal one in, which works very well. Just when you first get up, you got to kind of get your rhythm, you know? So it's good to be in Baltimore again. This is an important city for us because this is one of the place where much of our revolutionary response to slavery started coming out of Maryland. We don't talk about that a lot, but the African people in Maryland, you know, you're special people. And people don't understand the young people having some problems today, you know. Some of them are against Pan-Africanism, but that's not a good position to take because that means you don't understand that that simply means black people united. Some say I'm against nationalists, but they don't understand that this means you own where you live and you control where you live. Some say, and I agree with them on the term if they want to use it, the foundation of black Americans. That's true, but we also African Americans and we also Africans. And some of us are Moors and some of us are Hebrews, but all of us aren't Moors and all of us aren't Hebrews. Matter of fact, some of us are Christians. Think of it, if we say we were Moors, an, a, a, an identity that we were wearing, some of us in North Africa, hundreds of years ago, and we can still hold that valid for much of the last hundred years, most of us have been Christians. And under Christianity, yeah, I'm gonna take y'all someplace y'all never heard me go, because you need to go there, because we're not doing good where we're going are not as good as we should. We've done some extraordinary good. But we need to really back up a step or two 
and study the African American Christian movement. Because it's clear to me, we and, and I'm guilty of that too. We want to evolve from someplace to someplace, but you got to know where you're evolving from to know what you need to evolve back to. Y'all understand me? Did my brother look at me like, what Brother Small talking about? You, you with me? Okay. Some of the greatest things that happened to Black America happened coming out of the Black church. Now, the mistake I made in the 60s and 70s, and the mistake most of our leaders make, and some even today, is to presume that the Black church is the white church. And what is clear when you really study, the Black church was never the white church. The problem with the Black church is that the leadership of the Black church think they're the white church. But the people of the Black church was never the white church. That's what I figured out. Because almost everything that happened from the end of slavery, chattel slavery, to now, somehow emanated out of that group of people who said we are in the church. I asked the young sister to tell me what to speak about so she wouldn't verbalize it, so I'm picking her mind. She don't think I'm picking her mind because she may not think about this until next week or when she go off to study next year. But the African-American community, 90% of them go to church on Sunday. And even the Muslim and the Nationalist brothers who are going to celebrate Kwanzaa will quietly celebrate Christmas before Kwanzaa. So I'm trying to tell you something because freedom is about being free, right? And if you understand who you are, then you're free. Dr. Asa Hilliard said, true freedom is to be shackled to your identity. A brother from Nigeria isn't arguing about his identity. He says, I'm a Yoruba, or I'm a Igbo, or I'm from Benin State, and I'm from Nigeria. And he's clear on location. He's clear on geopolitical definition of his state. He's clear on his ethno-cultural space. As African Americans, we have a problem. Geopolitically, we are Americans. We said we don't want to be Americans. Well, get on a plane and leave. But if you don't get on that plane and go, you're an American. And people say, well, how is that? Because I'm going to get some feedback, but nobody give me no feedback. Because I can beat back any feedback. If you live in a geopolitical space, and you pay taxes there, and you work there, and you live there, and you follow the laws there, and you participate in the political process there, or not, that's part of your geopolitical identity. That is your geopolitical identity. You could deny it if you want with words, but reality puts you in that space and place. Common sense says if you're in a place and you deny that you're in that place, then you're not living in reality. And if you're not living in reality, you can't solve the problems of your reality. Y'all got that? And then we say we are African. Yes, that's our race. Not only is our race, it is our ancestral cultural space. And in that ancestral cultural space is millions of years of history. In that ancestral cultural space is millions of years of spiritual context and concepts that we can draw from. Because as this African America, Africa being our race, America being our geopolitical place, we come from Nigeria, Ghana, Mali, Morocco, Tunisia, South Africa, Congo, Kenya. We come from all over Africa. And we merged into one African ethnic nation in North America. Somehow the world don't want to let us have an identity. Without having an identity, you don't even have a place from which to foundation yourself to fight when things come against you economically, politically, and culturally. And it comes against us every day. And we fight it, we've been pretty successful. Matter of fact, if you look at our fight, we've been one of the most successful African population in the world in the last 400 years in fighting against the genocide of slavery, colonialism, and straight out white oppression. 
no other African population. We're the fourth African population in the world. Nigeria is the first largest. Brazil is the second largest. Colombia, which we don't even think about, is the third largest black population in the world, uh, in a nation state. And then us in North America is the fourth largest African population in the world. But we in North America, we also the wealthiest African population in the world. Last year, we spent more money than the GDP of Saudi Arabia. We spent more money than the GDP of Canada. We spend more money than the GDP of the Soviet Union. But since we don't know that, we don't see that. We think we're poor and we think we're broke and we think we're impoverished because somebody else controls the narrative that describe us to ourselves because we don't know ourselves as a self. Y'all understand me? I don't want to be up here just chitty chatting because I didn't come to waste nobody's time. And I didn't come to sell you no program. And I didn't come to, how do you say, make you feel good. Because you can go do like me and get a little kibasi and do that. Or you can get a little ganja and feel even better, you know. But I want to say something to you that you can say to others, right, about what's real. Right? And saying what's real isn't popular because people don't want to feel what's real. Because what's real make you want to change what is and people don't want to change what is but just remember the term true freedom this is dr asa hilliard is being shackled to your identity as an african-american population from an old african-american settlement maryland what is your identity who are you see a label isn't an identity the label must describe something. So I can say I'm foundational Black American, but what does that mean? Because if I say I'm foundational Black American, then my ancestors that predated Columbus, and you can look at my face and tell me like some of you, I got ancestors that predated Columbus. I used to clean their grave when I was a child. They didn't bury in the ground, they buried in the mounds. But they weren't Asiatic red people, they were Black people in South Carolina. This before the Gullah Geechee culture developed. There's an older culture there. They're the foundation of Black Americans. And most of us have never heard of them or don't even know them because they don't exist as a unique population anymore. They married into the rest of us and became the African American. So you need to read and study that. There isn't a lot of works on that. But um, David Imhotep's book, The First Americans for Africans, is a good source. Ivan Van Sertiman, who came before Columbus, is a good source. And then look at their bibliography. The thing that America is most afraid to talk about, you ever see America with all of the things we see on TV? They'll talk about anthropology and archaeology from everywhere in the world, but not here. You would think, as proud as they claim to be, they would talk about the anthropology and the archaeology of North America. Why don't they do it? Because every time they dig a shovel down, it comes up black. Not red, not yellow, not beige. It comes up black. And so it's the most well-kept secret and the well, most well-hidden history on the planet. But should, to us, that shouldn't be a mystery because we are the indigenous population of every space of Earth in the world. You go to Australia, first people are black. You go to New Zealand, first people are black. You go to India, first people are black. You go to Russia, the first people are black. You go to China. So why not North America? Why is it such a big surprise that it's North America? We go to Scotland, the first people are black. It was easier to get to the Bahamas from West Africa than it was to get to Scotland. It's like all of a sudden, in ancient days, we didn't know how to swim, or we didn't know how to get in a canoe. Matter of fact, if you go and look it up, I don't know the date or the names of the people, but you know how to Google stuff. Four white men got in a rowboat less than a year ago, and guess what they did? Rode from Africa to the Bahamas. 
They didn't have no ship big as the thing Columbus had, which wasn't much of a ship. They did it in a rowboat in two weeks. Right? So you tell me we couldn't have gotten here? If they could say some Asian brothers came through all that ice in the Bering, Bering Strait, and some others rode through the Eastern Isle in the distance, 10 times the distance between West Africa and, and, and Florida and North Carolina, why couldn't we have gotten there? We could have swam over here. You ever look at a map and see how close West Africa is to the Caribbean? We were coming and going for centuries. The point of it is it shouldn't be a surprise. And I'm raising these things because I'm hearing the discussion in the community about this confusion about who we are. I'm not confused about who I am. I'm an African-American. Africa is my race. America is my geopolitical place. Now, we can have other labels, too. I mean, it's cool to have labels, but you got to know who you are. We, either we came on the ship with shackles from Africa, or we came in the boat on our own from Africa, but we still came from Africa. So that non-African foolishness we're hearing in the rhetoric of so many people is childish and foolish. Yeah, Tariq, I'm talking to you, and I love you. You know you're my son, but I've spoken to you about this, you know? I've spoken to many others who are doing it. You're the most powerful. You have made yourself powerful. The ancestors and God gave you power in the media. Carry the right message to the people. That's why you were given that power. We talk about libation and ancestors and all of this stuff. We don't even believe that. Most of us. We're playing. And until we stop playing, they're not going to help us. Either the ancestors is real or not. I'm going to take my little brother. He just walked in. He got on a pretty black hat. How you doing, sir? You know the ancestors is real, don't you? And you know you are they, don't you? When your mama and daddy gave birth to you, they gave birth to themselves, didn't they? And when they were given birth to, they were given birth to by your grandparents who gave birth to themselves, didn't they? And then your great parents gave birth to them who was given birth to themselves, right? And you take that all the way back to when God first become a human, and that's our major and primary ancestor. So we are the ancestors we just poured the libation to. That's African culture. That's African high science. If we understand that you can never stop being what you are, ever. It doesn't matter whether you get a little light skin here, a little brown skin there. We were light skin and brown skin before we met white people. Look at our history. Look at the cave paintings. Go back as far as you want to go. We had every one of these shades then. We had eyes as slanted as anyone from Asia, lips as thin as anyone from Europe going back then, and lips as thick and beautiful as anyone from West Africa going back then. Dr. Noble's corner term, where he first threw it out and I picked it up, it's called Know your history and you get rid of the mystery. A lot of us read books that have exciting topics and, and, and uh, written by dynamic people, but we don't study history. I'm talking timeline history. Let me go as far back as the BC as I can get, and let me come up in as far as the AD as I can come. I want to know the history. I want to know the family tree, because that's what a history is. It's your family tree. And we can take all the names. You remember Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania? None of those names existed 100 years ago. That's all new stuff that Europe put on us in 18, after 1885, 84. So we're just African. When we left that continent for the Caribbean, for Central South America, and North America and those chains, there wasn't a single country in Africa now, I mean then, that's there now except Ethiopia. And Ethiopia at that time was not a country. That's a myth, too. Ethiopia is a Greek word, not an African word. And it wasn't a country. It was the Greek reference for the entire continent. There was a place named Aksum, a kingdom in, in East Africa, which is now called Ethiopia, in the way the place in West Africa is now called Ghana, or the old Ghana. So when we left Africa, it was just Africa. So it's not inappropriate to say we are an 
African American. It's not inappropriate. And people say, okay, well, the word Africa come from some white man named Leo Africanus. That's a child. Only a child would say some foolishness like that. An unread child would say foolishness like that. Show me that anywhere, written anywhere, in any anthropological, archaeological space, anywhere in the world, where that's the genesis of that word, or that's the etymology of that word. The word comes from Africa. But everybody in Africa didn't call themselves by that word. That was just one little ethnic nation, one family grouping in the place now called Tunisia and Algeria, when it was all black, before these people who are there now got there. And the Romans came to that land. The Greeks before them invaded our land and enslaved us. Slavery didn't start in 1619. Okay? Slavery started with the invasion of the Hyksos, the Hittites, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Every one of those invaders enslaved a portion of our population, sold us back into Europe, and made us their servant because they won the physical military battle. And to the victor goes the spoil, and we were the spoil. So when the Romans came, they saw these black-skinned people, dark-skinned people. So they described them using a Greek word for black, the Morush, which became the word anglicized, the Moors. There's no mystery about it. The brother could angry me. It's a brother small saying, there's no mystery about where the word come from. It was a description of black people, just like black in English is a description of black skin African people. It's no mystery. Why are we making silly arguments about mystery when we're supposed to be trying to get our people to come into a unity of understanding of who we are? And the second part, there was the people there, and you can find this family, believe it or not, still in Ghana today. They call the, they call the family Yafriye. Afriye, it's a family name, it's a clan name, but that's who lived in Tunisia and Algeria at that time. So the Romans in their writing, this is in their literature, they said we're going to Africa. Ka is an acronym and check it in the Roman language for land. We're going to Afri land where the blacks live, where the Marouche live. Just something simple. And then people say, well, we got to get in the etymology and the etymology. Stop being silly. By the time the Romans got there, black people was already in Australia, Australia for half a million years. So they were Moors down there. They didn't speak English. They didn't call themselves Marouche. I don't know what they call themselves, but I know they didn't use those languages. What I'm saying, there's a discussion in our community about identity. And it's being handled by children in a very foolish manner. But it's disturbing the spirit of the young people who are trying to find out who they are. Okay? And it's up to us who've been around a little longer to put our foot down and not listen to foolishness and speak on it. If you study any African language, they have one word for themselves. And that word is God. A word people are scared to say because in, in the English Christian, Judeo Islamic thing, and I've been in all of them already. I was an imam and a preacher and everything else. They make us afraid to associate ourselves with God. But if you look at the, in the African language and the mother tongue, which is called the Bantu tongue, and everybody's trying to make that the lesser tongue. No, that's the mother tongue. Even the tongue in Kemet is not the mother tongue. Medunetia is not your mother tongue. That is a derivative of the mother tongue. It is only famous because in the dry desert and the rocks, we were able to sustain the history. But guess what? What's on those rocks and the tombs and the paintings and all of that, as magnanimous as it seems, is not as powerful as what's in the language, the rituals and the culture and the belief system of those in Western Central Africa. 
because that culture is embedded in the mind of the human beings. Comes out in the language, the dance, the song, and everything, the structure, how they arrange the family. That is the culture of the world, the culture of God itself. Now, tying things to God, because I want to come back to why the African American Christians should not be demeaned as we and me included have done in the past. We don't demean no other group who have taken on Western religion to survive. But somehow there's a demeaning of the African American population that is unreasonable. And I don't want to any longer be a part of that unreasonable demeaning of one of the most magnificently fighting populations in the world. We are in the house of the devil. We're not in the devil's plantation where he's got a few of him there and a maximum of us. We're in the house of the devil as a minority and we've kicked his ass. And no one wants to give us credit for it. Yet everybody eats from the table we've set with our blood. And we're afraid to defend our blood that everyone is eating. Y'all understand me? I know people are hearing me all over the country. So cool, y'all understand me, because if you hear me, you understand me, because I'm a simplistic speaker. I make it plain, because that's what Malcolm taught us. Make it plain. If the people don't understand you, you should not be in front of them talking. Make it simple. This question of identity is important, because our kids should not have to go into universities and into schools and be demeaned by other people, even others that look like them, on the question of identity. How are you going to say, I don't know who I am, when you're trying to copy everything I'm doing? What's wrong with that picture? So the African-American identity is an African identity. We appropriately, people say, well, well, we used to be called Negroes. No, we wasn't. They called us Negro. But we used to be called colored. No, we wasn't. They called us colored. We chose to call ourselves black and we chose to call ourselves African-American. And that's different from them choosing to call us something. And I was among the we's in the 60s doing that. I'm 77, so I was out there kicking it in the 60s as a young man. When we were fighting to try and relabel ourselves and re-identify who we were with that continent. It wasn't something willy-nilly. We sat down and studied this stuff in study groups with a pistol or a rifle or something laying there. The Panther weren't the only one that carried the guns. Loved my brothers and sisters in the Panther Party. There were some bad, brave brothers and sisters, but every one of the revolutionary groups was armed and locked and loaded. It's just that the press didn't choose to go after them in the same way for the same reason. They went after the party. And because many of those revolutionary groups never became Marxist-Leninist, which was a European way of slaughtering so many of our militants, you know, by bringing us into this beautifully formed, nicely written ideology where we all end up dead or in jail. Well, Mia's coming home now. God bless you, baby. I know you're home, baby brother. And I'm glad you're there. You should have never been in prison in the first place. You know, I mean, Matula, I'm sorry. Well, Mia, we got to get you home. But Matula is now home, spending all that time in prison for a crime he did not commit. When you're a soldier fighting for freedom, actions you take against your enemy is not crime under any international protocols or code of conduct. But nobody in the international community fights to identify our brothers and sisters as freedom fighters. So we get classified as criminals in America for fighting for freedom. We're the only population in the world that get classified as criminals for fighting for freedom. And you know why? Because we don't affirm our identity. We don't affirm our identity. We let them cast us as individuals that happen to belong to organizations and not individuals that's fighting for the freedom of an ethnic nation that's being oppressed. I would guarantee you anyone that does the work will find that the population in North America have the largest cluster of African gene pool in any other clusters in the world. And the reason that happened, because the British with their poor dumb selves, they didn't have the power to be capturing us in Africa in the early days. So they were buying us from everybody else, from all over Africa, from Madagascar, from the Portuguese, from the Spanish, 
from the Dutch, from the Brandenburg, and bringing us here from all over that continent. And we amalgamated into one people that the whole world fears. We know the world fear us, the African American. Everybody does. We just don't understand why. Because even in our broken and fractured identity issue, we've been able to unite more to defeat oppression than any group I know. But then people in the so-called revolutionary cluster led by white Marxists from the left make you think that the only way you're revolutionary is that you got a gun or a knife in your hands. And yet they can't show you one victorious Marxist revolution anywhere in the world. And neither can you show one to me. Anybody can, raise your hand. I'll tell you, I'll let you come up here and explain it to the people. Show me. The closest is Cuba. And Cuba has depended more on its African Yoruba tradition than it has depended on the Marxist tradition how it structures and organizes itself. That's why history erased the mystery. And that's why identity is important. Because we are in a geopolitical fight around economic, politics, and culture. We're one of the wealthiest black populations on the planet Earth in any singular geopolitical state. But we have not been able to organize our riches into wealth because of the question of identity being solidified. You watch the East Indian, there's a book, it's called Tribes. And in that book, it shows the East Indian world tribe, um, from the bank in Mumbai, to the bank in London, to the bank in Guyana, to the bank in Trinidad, to the bank in America, to own a Motel 8 in America, to the, the owner in the gas station, how oh, it's all tied into one, economic network that ends up back in Mumbai. To the hair they grow to cut and sell you, it gets back to the bank in Mumbai. One man saw it and did something about it and they made him an evil villain. His name is Idi Amin Dada of Uganda. He saw the international network and says, I'm not going to tell you you can't live in my country, but you must bank your money in my country. If you don't bank your money in my country, I'm going to pay your fair price for your business and throw you out of my country. But they didn't tell you it was all that. They told you he just threw the Indians out. He paid everybody what the court said the business was worth. And the reason he did it, because they would not bank their money in Uganda. Now, if we had that simple understanding, our view of Idi Amin Dada would have been completely different. Those of us who are old enough to know who he was. Thank God he was able to escape to Saudi Arabia and live his life out. But it was Idi Amin Dada who said that the problem he had with the Jews in Uganda was that if they stayed in Uganda, the Ugandan would end up poor and they would end up rich. And most people don't know, before Israel was the settled place for the white European Ashkenazis, Uganda was the land the British gave to them to make new Israel. They had already begun to migrate there before they went to Palestine. So when we understand history, the race, the mystery, it makes it clear, it shows you the picture a little better. But back to our identity, and then we'll talk about some of the contemporary stuff, because this identity thing is very important, right? Young man right here, and you've already been a revolutionary all his life, and you still question who you are. Are you? Oh, don't worry about mine, do the same thing. I had one that wanted to be a gangster. <laughs> I had one that just wanted to be, I'm out here, you know, had another one who thought he was the gangster. Thank God we had enough African going on that they all were able to overcome. Because there's another world for everything your father tried to guide you with in terms of African consciousness. You could have 10,000 forces when you walk out of the door of that house trying to pull you someplace else. And our job as your parents is to come out there and raise hell to pull you back whether you like it or not. Right? Because it's a question of identity. Who are you? You're God having a human experience. Let's go back to the African language that I left a while ago. If you look at the word for people, person, place, or thing in all African language, you will find that in its prefix or suffix, the word for God is in that word. 
then you know, the prefix is the first part of the word. Suffix is the last part of the word. No matter what the words that be in person, people, place, or thing. And in all African language, the prefix or the suffix is the same word they use for God. What does that tell you they were saying about themselves in terms of identity? That we are the God people. We are God people. They didn't label themselves like we did today, like a country of uh, America or England or Nigeria. They were just people of the earth. That's all they were. They, whatever the word for earth was, that's, how they, that's what they meant by their land. What was the thing that they saw that made them peculiar in their bonding? It was their culture. Then the word culture we know in the English language come from that to cultivate. What does cultivating mean? Is I grow something, the thing that grows things. So what cultivates a human being? What grows a human being? It's the knowledge of the earth. Everybody in here is made of dirt. Did you know you were made of dirt? You sure? She's a, yeah. Yes. Every bit of food we eat comes out of the dirt. And if you decide, well, I'm, I had a little piece of beef this morning, which I did have a little piece of beef this morning, right? Guess what? The cow eats grass that comes from the dirt and earth, fueled by the sunlight from the cosmos, right? That's what I would say, ashes to ash and dust to dust. We are really dirt, empowered by the fire of the energy of the universe with the sun being the hottest bit of the fire, but we receive all the light. We receive the light from Mars, Jupiter, everywhere. We absorb some of those light. Take a million years to get here, we still suck up that light. That light energy and this matter, this mineral energy in Earth, the combination of that is what the Africans call God. In most of their language, they refer to what we call God as the totality of creation. All that can be known about all that is. And in African cosmology, you will not see a beginning and you will not see an ending because no such things exist. That's in our mind to silence our fears. So we have to create boundaries. There's no boundaries. There is no beginning. The possibility of the concept of what we call the beginning can't be imagined if you look at the universe. And we are a planet. Are we not aliens? We float in the same space with all the other planets. You know? But they don't let us think. They make it think that we're on some stationary little spot and we're looking at the planets. No. We are flying around in outer space like everybody else and everything else in existence. And the Africans understood that. So they always saw the divine as every and all things at once, including us. That's the simplest way to put it, that each of us represent an aspect of the divine essence having the human experience in our own peculiarity. You could be twins, identical, but there's still something peculiarly particular about each one of you that's not there with the other one. Like that finger. Millions and millions of cells make up that little finger. Yet they're not bumping into each other. If they get confused, I dissolve, right? Through disunity, not knowing that my unification around understanding my purpose. My purpose is to produce this instrument called a finger. And so when it comes to the identity of a people, that's the way you have to see yourself. That's the way. You got to understand and know yourself. Unity is the greatest power we could have. And we have more of it than we think we do. We are so big. We are big people. Right? We're the fourth largest African population in any nation state in the world. They tell us that we are 45 to 50 million. Then they'll say, but we didn't count one third of you. What does that mean? How are you going to tell me I'm 45, 50 million, but then you say in the census, we miss one third of you. So I'm 80 million plus then, if we're going to be real. We're already the majority of America, except we don't know it. 
Let me show you a secret. Say they said the Latino make up, we make up what? 13 to 14 percent. The Latino population make up about 20 percent. But we know they never really did a real census of the Latino population. Forget about that one. And then they admit they only they miss one third of us. Now try to factor that in. We're gonna be play mathematicians. And we're gonna factor back in. We want all of the black people that speak Spanish, that you call Latino, to be black people like the rest of us. All right. If I come from Africa and I speak English, you count me. But if I come from Africa and I speak Spanish, you don't get counted as the black population. Do you realize that? And we're the only group that don't have their people counted because the language is different. If you come from England, you're white. If you come from France, you're white. If you come from Italy with your mixed self, you're white. If you come from Germany with a different language, you're white. But if we come from Puerto Rico, black as midnight, we're not black. That's why they put that little caveat in there, Hispanic, non-white. Because they mean there's another population of Hispanics who's totally separate and they don't even give them a category to belong to. That's the black folks, the majority of the Hispanic population. If that population came home to us like they're supposed to, like all other populations do, we'd be the largest ethnic group in America. Right now, they acknowledge that we are the second. The Germans is the first. Remember, white Anglo-Saxons, people you call Englishmen, those are Germans. All right? We never, we forget about history, right? Remember the Anglos and the Saxons? They invaded those islands. They're not from the place they call Britain. They invaded the black people who were there, the Scots and the Irish, the mixed groups and mess them up. So we have to think in terms of our identity. And we got it pretty good. We don't understand what we've got. We got all these soras. How many people is a sora in the room? Raise your hand. Belong to a sorority? How many brothers belong to fraternities? Y'all a bunch of rebels down here in Baltimore, huh? But if you know, all of those sororities and fraternities have a flip side. That shield, is, if they flip the shield, it's got an African symbol, most of a comedic. They're hiding the secret. Why are you hiding it? We're free now. Why do we still have to hide that you're an imitation of things black? And you're not a Greek ordered fraternity at all. Never was. So we took the illusion and made it the reality and we keep the reality hidden in a secret. Come back to the black churches around this question of identity. It wasn't the black church and Christianity that was so politically powerful. The thing that was politically powerful was the Freemasons, the Prince Hall Masons working through the black church followed by the Knights of Pythias and the Oddfellas, the Eastern Stars, the Daughters of Ruth, and the Daughters of Tent. Organization we know very little about. How many people have heard of the Daughters of Tent? One. This is a very powerful group of sisters that came into being shortly after the Civil War. And some of those orders still exist. I know there's one in Brooklyn, New York, I'm sure. There's down in South Carolina and other places. Most of us know of the Eastern stars because the Masonic wing got so big, so we knew of, this, of the stars. But we don't know how powerful they are. So what we have to understand is that this people, that that part of Africa that we call Freemasonry, but true Masons know that this comes right up out of Africa. And this is, how do you say, our ancient part, a part of our ancient management system. So it's important to study your history as African Americans. And then you be able to get rid of the mystery that other people have placed on us. And then we'll have more respect for the leadership that we have. Because almost every one of your male leader from the 1740s to the 1980s no matter what denominational religion they were, were Freemasons in Prince Hall. 
something worth studying, something worth looking at. And there's a good book out called The History of Black Masonry. I forgot the author, but I'm gonna send it to you and you can share it later. And I'm saying this because people wanna take away our identity while reaping the fringes of our struggle. Not just other people of color who are doing it under desperation trying to survive, but we support them, that's family. Come on in, we're gonna have a conversation so we can get a right relationship. But white folks do it too. White women are the biggest recipients of affirmative action. White families are the biggest recipients of food stamps. White family is the largest group on welfare. You name anything we battle to make this nation do for us, poor and working population, and white people are enjoying it more than us while calling us ugly names for even trying to get what we deserve, even when we are underserved by what we deserve. And one of the reasons we're not able to take the stance we need to stance is that common identity that let us know you mind. The Yoruba had a word for it. They call it lukumi. Some people don't have a problem. Oh, Brother Small, that's a religion in Cuba. The word lukumi is a Yoruba word that means you belong to me and I belong to you. When the slave trade was going on, there was no Nigeria. There was no Yoruba land like we know it today. The Euro ethnic nation was all over West Africa. It is today the largest ethnic nation in West Africa. And when the slave ship would pick up our people at different ports, they recognized each other from the scarification. And they knew who family was. And scarification was also their written language. The West call it scarification, but it was a language. And when people saw their people, they said, look on me. You belong to me. I belong to you. That's all we got to say. Look on me. I'm ready to die for you. You are also ready to die for me. And that's the kind of an attitude the African-American population needs to develop. That attitude of look on me. I don't care if you're Baptist. You belong to me. I don't care if you're Muslim. You belong to me. I don't care if you're Methodist. You belong to me. I don't care what sorrow you belong to. You belong to me. And we haven't gotten there because we haven't solidified our culture. See, everybody have a culture. Culture isn't something you bring from one place to the other. Culture is something you build on what you brought from one place to the other. Okay? We brought what we had at home, but we came to a new ecology under new circumstances, under new conditions. So we had to recreate new ways of responding to our environment. We had to recreate new ways of responding to the other human beings who are not friends down there, our enemy in the practicing genocide against us. We have to find new ways to teach ourselves how to survive, both in the social ecology, the, the psychological ecology, and the physical ecology. And those things that we use to do that, our dance, our music, our dress, our talk, that's what you call culture. Culture is everything that a people do to sustain themselves in the environment in which they find themselves. That means some of the old stuff is no use to us when we got here, we had to throw them out. Then we had to create some new stuff to meet the challenge of the day. And black Americans have not consolidated that yet. We have not pulled it together. We should have a holiday, which means holy day, special day, which represent an episode out of your history for 365 days. Now, some may be big days, you know what I'm saying? But we said we ain't going to work today, none of us. And some may be things we just celebrate in our house or celebrate on the weekend. But that's one of the first steps we need to do is to make each one of the 365 a holy, sacred day. And if you study Africa, every single African population had a specific thing for a specific day, 365, or how many days they celebrated. And they usually call those things gods when the West, new people look at it. But what they were talking about is on each of these days, we will celebrate an aspect of the quality and attributes of the human character that we imitate from what we call God 
in developing ourselves in the process of life. Y'all got that? And that was a long sentence there. You got that little one? You sure? Okay. Because that's an important one, right? And what's important about this, we've been in a war. But we don't realize we've, we've been in a war in America. We're still in a war in America. And it's not a war between black and white. It's a war between right and wrong, good and bad. And we've been the ones trying to do the good and the right. And somebody's been doing us very bad. But they've made the bad the right thing. And they made behaving good the wrong thing. And we haven't quite figured out how to carry out the fight because they constantly try to goad us into behaving as they do. We're never going to win the fight becoming the demon that they are because they're the best demon there is. You're not going to win that fight. And that's why we've been hurting each other and shooting each other and doing the things we're doing because we're trying to respond the way we think the power responds. But that's not real power. There's only real power if you give them that power. But fear makes you see that as power because it took away from you your sense of what is life and what is death. And once he puts you in that little box and frame it, he says, I can take away your life and put you in death unless you do what I want you to do. But if you knew there's no such thing as death, and what he's calling death, each of us will meet no matter what one day anyway, and nobody know when, how, or why you will meet it, then you'll have a different attitude about life and how to preserve it. But that's a part of what you call culture, values, beliefs, ideas, concepts, and principles that allow you to love and protect rather than injure and destroy. That's the war we're really fighting. And that's a hard war because in this culture, they haven't allowed us to see it that way. In our cultures at home, for instance, like I, I practice the Yoruba tradition. I practice all of them. You can learn a little something from everything. I practice the voodoo tradition. They got some good stuff up in there too. I even look at the Christian tradition. They got some good stuff up in there too. But in your tradition, and I always tell this one story, I'm a priest of what you call Oya. Oya is one of the Orishas. Oya represents the wind. The wind represents what? Change in process. So Oya is symbolized by a woman with locks. There's this woman with these long locks running around. She's just as cute as she can be in the metaphor, you know, in the artwork. But she's the concept and idea that's in the mind of every human being. But that, in the folklore, and the metaphor, they tell a story that Oya will fall in love with a king named Shango. Shango is a brave, courageous, powerful king. So he symbolized courage. Courage for what? Courage to change. But if you have, if you have developed the courage to change, what do you have to do? You have to marry Oya, because she is change. Once you marry Oya, change in process, she must then practice polyandry and marry Ogun. Why? Because Ogun is transformation as a result of change. So when they're telling the metaphor and the story, they're teaching you a lesson in human transformation in terms of the human character and the human spirit based on quality and attributes that you must acquire in your culture on a daily basis. You all got that? I want to make it sound like a little lesson. I know I'm not kindergarten anybody, but I'm trying to tell you that our people had it together. They had a purpose for what they were doing. They never saw no bunch of gods. They knew that there was only one God. And it wasn't a person. It wasn't a human being though it could become a human being, the Christian took that idea and created the Jesus story. But each one of us is God becoming a human being. That's what the story was about. It wasn't about one particular little boy that had a special occasion. It was about all human beings. When you come into being, you're God coming into being. And as such, you would expect it to adopt the quality and attributes of the divine and then use the quality and attributes of the divine to help others ascend to the quality and attributes of the divine who wasn't doing it as well as you did. 
You'll understand that. Is a reason why our people turned to Christianity so powerfully. We weren't Christian doing slavery. And we were never enslaved for 400 years. We were enslaved for about 260 years. Okay. This is the shortest enslavement segment in any country except Trinidad. Trinidad had the shortest enslaving process. North America had the next shortest enslaving process. But they continued our genocide of slavery under what they call Jim Crow. That's what makes it 400 years. But in the chattel process, that was 260 something years. And when you look at that, when we went into the Christian church, it was after 1865. And we did that because that was the only sanctuary we had. And you had, had to have some place to hide and be who you were gonna be. And there was no other hiding place for us. The only sanctuary we had was that church. Out of that church flowed in 1885, a movement which is one of the oldest breakaway movement in the country, the Hebrew Israelite movement out of Memphis, Tennessee. Out of, I think it was the seven, is it Seventh Day Adventists or the other one, one of the holiness churches. But that's when that movement evolved and that movement be followed later by the, the, the Islamic movement. Because when we came here, we were Muslims, some of us. When we came here, we were Hebrew, some of us. When we came here, we were Christians, some of us. So when slavery was over, people tried to get back to what their ancestors say they were. When we came here, we were Yorubas. When we came here, we were Akans. When we came here, we were Voodoo. We came out of all those different traditions. And people, when they had the freedom to do it, they tried to get back. But the safest place to be an African was the church. And I says, in the beginning, because my grandfather was a preacher. So, you know, I grew up hating the church after a while. Though, this is suffering. But I remember when I went to the moaning bench. How many people in there went to the moaning bench? Y'all southerners. One, the moaning bench, when everybody in the community, boys and girls, get 13 in that church community, they get called in. And then you go to church that day, and you pick a church father. The girls pick a church mother, and the boys pick a church father. And this person will guide you for the rest of you until you become an adult, along with your parents. That's your African uncle and your African auntie. So we were imitating that in the church. Then we had to go in the morning, then a year in that process of just going to church and having these elders guide you. Then you had to go on your knees. That's the morning. And you, you had to keep your eyes closed. And they would always bring in a preacher from out of town, somebody who could really rip it up, shake it down, do the African thing, right? And you had to get what they call the Holy Ghost. That's the only way you can get up off the bench. That is spiritual, um, what do they call that? Taking over of your body. And you got up shouting and dancing and doing all these African dance you never knew you knew. And they knew you couldn't fake because they were deacons and Deacon S there to test you to make sure you weren't lying, that you really had, they call it the grace. But in Yoruba tradition, we call it being possessed by one of the divine, right? So when you came up, then the whole church celebrated you and you were set in a different, until everybody on that bench got up in that age group. And when I read Facing Mount Kenya by Jomo Kenyatta, it was all there. And so, oh my God, Papa and them, they didn't know nothing about no Jomo Kenyatta, facing my Kenya. They didn't know nothing about the Mau Mau. So how are they doing this? They brought it with them. And they hid it in the church. And they disguised it with a Christian cloak. But it was the African age group set. It was the African initiation set into manhood and woman, like the poor old society in Liberia and Sierra Leone still do till this day but they only had the space of the church to do it in. So when we go to that church, that's where we buried Africa in America because that was the only safe haven allowed. And we, where we buried the leadership guidance is with a beautiful black man in Boston and his comrades called Prince Hall. Do the research and you'll find that you have nothing to be ashamed of as an African-American nothing, then you'll find your real power. Then you'll find Africa again. But you then have to study Africa, because see, when you look in a mirror, 
Africa is the mirror. That's where you see a reflection of yourself. If you study the African culture, before I studied African culture, I didn't know what the morning bench was. I didn't know that was Africa hidden in a crazy, white people ain't got no morning bench. They didn't march through the community in white like we did and go to a river and be baptized. The baptism wasn't the essence. It was the marching through that community, receiving all those gifts and all those praise from your family because that's where the kids who came back from having spent months and even years in the secret society being trained, when they came marching back in that community, how they were praised like young gods and goddesses. Coming back home now as adults to become a part of the greater adult population in the community. We didn't lose it. They did not take it all from us. I'm gonna tell you another one of the story, then I wanna come and talk about brother Kyrie and, and Kanye for a minute. I was, I grew up in the country, so you know in the woods, when church is on Sunday, when you clap, you can hear it for miles. It just reverberates through all the trees and it's a beautiful sound. You just hear the vibration through all the woods. So there was one rhythm that I just could never get out of my head. And I learned to play it on the drum. I thought it was just my thing. So when I go to Africa and I go to find my first djembe, it was a Friday. And all the drums is up on the walls and stuff and the brother, but there was no brother there except the brother who brought me. And so it was Juma. So the brothers had all gone to pray. So I started playing on the drum, right? Only rhythm I know is what I heard in the church, reverberating through the woods. People came running from everywhere with sticks, with bricks, with rocks. And I'm thinking, they're thinking I'm trying to steal the drum. And I'm an African American. My second trip to Ghana, don't know what, said I've even touched these people drum. But the brother with me started yelling to them, yelling to them that I was an African American and I wanted to buy this drum. And I wasn't. And then they explained to the brother why they came. They came because the rhythm that I was playing, that I heard bouncing through the woods coming from the church on Sunday, it was a rhythm that was, um, how, how the best way to put it? It was a call of distress. It was saying, I need help. I, I'm, I'm sending out this distress signal. And that blew my mind. If anything ever made me make the 180 to being an African, it was that occasion. Then I realized that my people were not fools, that my people had not lost Africa that everything was not taken away from us. We hid it in plain sight and called it black Christianity. Yes, we brought the framework of white Christianity because white Christianity comes out of the ancient Nile Valley black Christianity to start with. So it ain't really that big a deal. And then when I started studying more later, and this is for the general public so they understand me, my Christian brothers and sisters, the Catholic Church is a thousand, a thousand years younger than the Ethiopian Church, than the Sudanese Church. Isn't that something? All of the Protestant Church was given birth to five years later by the Catholic Church, which makes them 15 years, 1,500 years younger than the Ethiopian Church and the Sudanese Church. Do you all understand what I'm saying? See, we got ripped, then played. Right? And then we played ourselves in our ignorance like I did when I was younger, because I didn't know any better. I thought that was theirs. It's like somebody take my little Hyundai, that's great, nice little Santa Fe Hyundai, drives really good, and paint my gray Hyundai blue, and drive right up to me and ask me if I want to ride. And I thought I'm riding in their nice little blue Hyundai. But I'm really riding in my nice little gray Hyundai that they kind of innovated on and called theirs. I hope that makes simple sense to people. And you study this, don't take my word for it. Just go look up here, you can get on the Google, you can Google all the stuff I'm saying right now. And don't let anybody tell you Google ain't a good research platform, that's foolishness. They use the same encyclopedia in the same colleges that everybody do if you walk into the library and open the book yourself. If you like me and you like to read, then go open the book yourself. 
And the very church, now Ethiopia and Sudan didn't start Christianity in the form that they have it, even though theirs are very different from what we call Christianity. It was the church is called the Benzantian church. This is the first manifestation of what we call Christianity. Where is that? That's in the place we now call Turkey, right? But there were no white people living in Turkey then. It was only black people. Now they call the Bantian church, the Benzantian church. Now they call it the Eastern Orthodox church. You all understand me? You got to play with the history because you see how they hide it and make it a mystery. And once you get the history, you remove their mystery. All right? And so the church didn't go north because these were not northerners. These were black people. So when the white invaders come from the north, the church ran south into Ethiopia and into Sudan and into Egypt. You understand me? And it became the Egyptian Coptic church in Egypt. And if you go to the Egyptian Coptic church today, every statue in the ancient time of, of the Christ figure and his family and his disciples and mother, so they're all black. While you got all these white Arabs worshiping there, all of the images of black people. You go to the Soviet Union, they got more black Jesus and Mary up in there than, than they got white people in the Soviet Union. It's just studying history, remove the mystery, and let you kind of put things in a different context. And when you put a timeline on it, you say, wait a minute. When Martin Luther do his reformation that started the Protestant church movement, which is what most of our people are into in the Western world today and in Africa, the Ethiopian and Sudanese church was already 1,500 years old. So who's Christianity? We have, yeah, we got to clean it up. You know, like somebody take your boat and mess it all up, and you got to take it and wash it out and clean it. But whose boat? Who built the boat? Right? They may cut the sail off and put a new motor on the back or something. You got some rearrangement to do. But if you don't understand the history, you get trapped into their mystery. I'm just telling people how to free themselves. You want to free your mind. So it'll free your behind. You got to study history, erase the mystery. And let's start with the church. You will find if you really got serious, there's more African in that church than there is Europe. But you have to go looking for it, and you can't look for it unless you study Africa first. So you can see yourself, and when you turn back in the church, you will identify yourself. It's very important because our people ain't going to walk out of that church. I can tell you that now. I've been out here recruiting for 60 years. <laughs> My sister said, James, we love you. If, you're going, if you come to visit me, you're going to church on Sunday. What am I going to tell my sister, Rudy? I ain't going to church? No, that, then I won't eat that day. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to church, and sometimes that music gets so good, I feel like getting off into the Holy Ghost. Because it's all African rhythm. It's all African rhythm. We got some of the modern stuff, that, you know, dealing with the European. Um, non secretic stuff, but most of the rhythms in our church are African rhythms. All right. And in our music that flow out of that, Af those African rhythms, you know, our blues music, our jazz music, our bebop music, our rag, rag music, hip hop is not something new. Hip hop is just the, was just the next step in a process of people explaining themselves through rhythm using what tools that was available. By the time the 70s and 80s came and they took all the horns out of school, the bands out of the school, got rid of the drum and bugle scores in the street, kids had no instrument, had no music, God said, I will speak through you with your tongue. And that would make music enough for the world. And hasn't it done so? But it's the same African rhythm because all music is is your externalization of your vibration that you, ex your internalization vibration that you externalize for others to harmonize with. You know, you make your little beat and I'm here and I'm sitting in front of, well, yeah, the iron in her just hook up with the iron in me. The zinc in him just hook up with the zinc with me. The manganese in her just hook up with the manganese in me. And we all feel in the same pulsation. It sounds good, no matter how we rearrange. It's all African musicology. But the point is, y'all get the point. 
that we have nothing to feel the same of being an African people under no conditions, no circumstances. We have nothing to be ashamed of being African American people. People say, well, y'all killing so much of yourself and all the shooting in the streets. If you had on your head in another country what we've had on ours, you'd be doing a lot more than what we do in the streets. Because 97% of our people ain't in no streets shooting nobody. But we don't even have a conversation about the 97%. We only talk about the 3 or 4%. And we try to use the 3 or 4% to define the 97%. And we've got to stop doing that. How many of our children go to college every year? How many graduate every year? How many go in there 13, 14, 15 years old to college every year? How many are coming up with A's across the board and all this? Nobody talks about them. You want to show the world, you pick up the one that happened to be beaten down by you that's been abused since there was a child, a young girl that's been raped since she was 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, that's been mutilated before she ever thought about becoming a woman. And then you're going to take her experience as a woman and try to define the entire black community by not addressing the fact that you've been murdering and mutilating that child for a decade or two. Or you take a little 14 year old boy and you throw him in prison for a crime he didn't commit because you want to meet your arrest quota in Baltimore or New York. Then he goes to prison and gets raped and molested and beaten and brutalized and frightened out of his mind that he hates everybody, including himself. And in that hurt, pain, and hopelessness coming back out here, he can't get a job because his fellow knows he can't vote, he can't be, even be a citizen. And he turns to violence out of fear and hatred and misunderstanding. And you're going to make him the criminal? You better check yourself. Because those kids are going to become the gods one day. Because we won't look at history so we can erase his mystery. Then we can help our children. But you got to know history. You got to know history to erase the mystery. We got to look at these young people. They say gun violence. There ain't no gun violence nowhere in America. I've owned a gun since I was my first gun. Mom and them gave me a 22 long pump. I was 14. My second one, which is the one I love, is the two shot Derringer. That was my 16th birthday. Okay. My 18th birthday, I bought my own gun. There's never a time when I did not own a gun as an adult. My gun ain't shot nobody. Guns don't shoot people. People shoot people. Minds and the bodies of people shoot people. So what is wrong with the minds of the people that are shooting people? And who made those things wrong with those minds? And that's where you go to solve the problem. You want to solve the problem of violence in our community? Solve the problem of education in our community. So that when a child walks out of high school, he has hope and possibility to either go to college or get a job or go to trade school or do something, but not walk out of a high school and can't read, can't write, can't think. Yet they're going to age like everybody else. They're going to get involved sexually like everyone else. They're going to have responsibilities like everyone else. But the inability to meet the needs of those responsibilities, what do you think they're going to do? what any population in that condition have done throughout time. And so we've got a job to do. We need to change the education of our children. It's got to start in our home. Nobody else going to teach us our history so we can erase the mystery. We got to teach that in our homes. Or we have to make the churches and mosques that we go to turn themselves into after school where there's STEM programs in math and science and every one of them for our children when they get out of these public schools who won't teach them anything. That African culture and history is taught. You only need a couple of hours a week to do this. And you will transform the black community overnight. That's why when Kyrie pressed that little button and tweaked a story about the Hebrew Israelite community, and then another people jump up and says, I got a right to say I'm you, but you don't have a right to say you are you. Think about it now. You have another population who clearly, ethnically, and racially don't come from that part of the world, claiming the history of a people from that part of the world, claiming it to the point that they've taken over the, the geographical part of the world. But when the people who can prove historically that they come from that part of the world say, I come from that part of the world, 
and that's my identity you're wearing, they accuse them of being anti-Semitic. And we don't know how to fight that accusation. One man fought it, and I'm going to mention him later on. His name is Dr. Leonard Jeffries. And he went to court. But what the white media who beat up on him for over a year or two, almost every day, didn't tell you, he won the court case. He won the court case for two point something million dollars, but they refused to pay him. And they sent the case to the Supreme Court to be heard. And it landed on the jurisdiction of Clarence Thomas, who refused to hear the case and sent it back to the New York Jewish Appellate Division, which buried it. Okay. But they never told you that in the newspapers, you know. Because no one can win a case against you accusing you of being anti-Semitic. But no one takes him to court. Leonard Jeffries is the only one that took him to court. They didn't take him to court. He took them to court and won. And a Negro in the Supreme Court made it a loss because of his unconscious backwards uh, education. But when Kyrie did what he did, he did it just as an innocent young black man, seeing some body of knowledge he thought was of value to some other black people. And he tweeted, I tweet stuff all day. I Facebook stuff all day. If I think it's a nice, nice piece of history, sometimes I get some of it wrong, but 90% of the time it's a nice piece of history. I like to share history. And the world came at him. President spoke against the child. What were they so afraid of? They were afraid of that young man being free. They went after Kanye. People said, well, Kanye did this. I don't care what Kanye did. It ain't their business to put their hand on one of our children. I don't care what he did. So he married a little white girl. That ain't no little white girl. That's a little mixed race girl. She know that whole family on the mixed race. They made money of being mixed race, big behinds. Now, Kanye may think she's a little white girl. I understand that. But I ain't going to cri cripple him for that. There's a whole plenty of us who ain't got his money who are doing the same thing. So we, we should not condemn him. It's like listening to Arnold Schwarzenegger. He ain't white. White people make him white. His very name tells you who he was. Swatza, German for black, Negra for black. He's Arnold the Black Black. Okay? Arnold the Black Black. But we don't know the language. We don't know what's going on, right? So you see these little Eastern European girls. Even Trump is married to a mixed race person and he out here with his racist confusion. You know? It's, it's ignorance or something. <laughs> ignorance is a deep thing, right? That's why we got to study our history, get rid of that ignorance, so we can erase their mystery. But all Kyrie was trying to do, and what they were trying to do, is saying, you do not have the freedom to express yourself. And we're going to show you, but okay, how much money are you making for us? And they're going to try to humiliate them. You got to give money to the ADL. That's called extortion. But nobody called that extortion. The white man who's selling the tape, nobody criticized him. What's his name the, the, from the Jeff Basil? Basil? Mr. Basil. He's selling the tape. And say he ain't going to stop selling it. Making big money off of it. No one has criticized him. If they've done it, they've done it on the down low. And they come to crucify one of our children and we sitting back, some of the black ball players stuttering or criticizing that child with no integrity to show for their, their, their so-called persona that the Shaq have and, 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 and the other one in Cleveland have. I don't know, I don't even watch ball game. I don't play that. I played in high school and I played in college and then I realized the reason I got a bad knee today is I played in high school and I played in college, you know? But we didn't handle that right. I spoke out. Minister Farrakhan spoke out and some others spoke out. And some of them, I heard that the young man in Cleveland did reverse his position. So I, I, James, his name. So that's good for him, because I was proud of him. I go to Cleveland all the time. He does a lot of beautiful things out there for black children. So he got caught by his handlers coming and say, read the script. But he seemed to turn himself around. But the point is, 
And when it comes to Kanye, if I don't watch much follow, but I'm on Facebook and, and Instagram and Twitter every day. So I'm hearing what the young people are saying. Three months before that incident happened, Kanye was talking about how could he break the contracts, right? And this is carried all over Twitter. It was a conversation. Now, he never said death to Jews. Let me know my time, son. Let me go. Do that little five finger thing. Okay. So, Kanye, I served in the US Navy. We had a term called DEFCOM. DEFCOM 1, that means the threat's coming after you. DEFCOM 2, that threat is getting pretty serious. DEFCOM 3, the threat is imminent. Defend yourself. That's what he said. He said, I'm going to go DEFCOM 3 on these Jews that's after me. Meaning that they're coming at me with such a fierce danger, I'm going to mean protect myself. That's what the word meant. I'm going to protect myself against this threat coming against me. And when the media came out and said he said death, he was protesting over and over. That's not what I said. And they didn't care. They did not care. Why? Because they realized that he was going to break away from them no matter what. So they decided you can break away, but you will not break away with the billions. You will not have that money to go out there and do something black with. So we're coming after you. And so I call it an economic attack on the black community when they attack Kanye. They said, oh, you want to break away? Well, we're going to take all the money we can. But here's what they didn't tell you. In the run-up, they could take the money back when they break the contracts. But guess what? They broke the contracts. So guess what they got to do? Pay Mr. Kanye. That's what the media is not saying. Because he didn't break the contract. They broke the contract. Now, he may never get his money. You know what I'm saying? They may tie him up in court for eternity. But we better be listening to the drum beat and not be fooled by little actors playing news commentators at 6 o'clock every day. Do our research and see what's the real deal. Because a young man wanted to be free. He isn't the first one. Ray Charles did it. And thank God he was relatively successful. Otis Redding tried. He died in a mysterious plane crash. Sam Cooke died, and he was murdered and slaughtered in the motel. If you even look at the life of Nat King Cole, because we don't study history, so we call it the mystery. Nat King Cole created a whole flew a record label and a whole record company in Mexico then tried to bring it back to America when he got his mysterious cancer that took him out like that. James Brown set up his record industry in four different places, I think Detroit, New York, and somewhere else, Baltimore. And his son, he sent to college, the boy just finished his master's degree when he got hit by the tractor trailer truck on the Jersey Turnpike. Study history. Tupac Shakur, Biggie studied history, followed the bunks and ball. They were trying to take over distribution of rap music. And all of a sudden, the media started talking about this fight between East Coast, West Coast. All right? And I spoke to the young man. I spoke to Tupac. He said, I, I don't need to big up off of Tupac. Name. I'm bigger than Tupac ever was. Yes, I am. I've been out there for 60 years. I'm the heir to Malcolm X. I never even have to talk about that. When he was assassinated, I'm the guy that became the imam at 21 years old. If I want to play big up, I got the big up to play with. But no one has ever used me that to raise me up. I've walked on my own energy, you know? And I spoke to that young man two days before he died when he called my house because they wanted a meeting with me when they left Las Vegas. And he told me what they were doing. And I told him that how dangerous it was. And he said him and Biggie understood, but he wanted me to understand that the rift between him and Biggie was made up. And that was not them. And that they were fighting to get control of the distribution of rap music. And then they said they had other brothers who was working with them. They were recruiting other young people. And I remember right after he got killed, his cousin and another brother got killed in Jersey about a week later. And that went kind of like under the radar a bit, right? But for the same reason, they went after Kanye. 
you know. They said, we're not going to let you take control of this lucrative industry that makes billions of dollars for us every year. Billions of dollars. You think I'm going to, you know, when you talk about killing of Malcolm X, let me show you something. Somebody said, Brother Minister Malcolm X, what do you mean by black nationalism? He said, black nationalism is when you control the economic, the politics, and culture where you live. Now, if you take control of economic, politics, and culture in the so-called black ghetto at the time of Malcolm X, you were taking over over a half a trillion dollars of wealth from certain white communities. Y'all think we kill him because he talked tough? No. If you take over control of the black community at the time of Malcolm X and put into place his concept of black nationalism, controlling the economic, politics, and culture where you live, you take a half a trillion dollars out of somebody's coffer. What do you think they're going to do to Mr. Malcolm X? Blow his brains out. And pull blame the nation, who was silly enough to get into a tit-for-tat argument in the media when they should have never played into that. But they played into it, and Malcolm played into it to some degree himself. And they murdered him in plain sight and got away with it. And the person who murdered Malcolm X was the Central Intelligence Agency, the FBI, New York City's Police Department, and Interpol. All of them had a stake. The FBI didn't want him and Dr. King uniting, and they'd already agreed that they would unite. The CIA didn't want him hooking up with Ernesto Che Guevara because two weeks from the date that he was killed, him and Che Guevara were supposed to be the keynote speaker at the Non-Aligned Nation Conference in Algeria, invited by Ahmed Ben Bella. That was going to throne that whole American thing for trying to you know, get all the new independent nations in the 60s to come into their camp and not Russia's camp. Interpol was, you coming over here into Africa, where we got all this colonial control and stirring up these Africans about some freedom? That's why you got poison in Egypt. How do you get poison in Egypt in the Muslim world at Nasser Gamal, Nasser's table, unless the Muslims poison you? Orthodox Islam didn't want a Malcolm X. Malcolm X wasn't invited over to the Middle East to speak by them. He was invited to speak by the radical Muslim student associations who they didn't want in their country, the bin Laden of that day. So they gave a thumbs down when the West said, we're going to kill him. Y'all understand what I'm telling y'all? <laughs> because you don't, you don't know history, you're dealing with other people's mystery, right? But you got to understand your history, and you know who your enemies are. Because they haven't gone any place. They change name now and then. And so when they came after Kanye, they came after Kanye for the same reason they went after Sam Cooke, the same reason they went after Otis Redding, the same reason they went after James Brown's son, the same reason they went after others before them. You ever heard of a beautiful black woman, one of the most craziest black woman singers out there? And her name was Ruth Brown. I was in love with that lady from the time I was five years old. All right? She was the most extraordinary voice in black America. But once she decided to fight for her royalties, you heard no more about Ruth Brown, but she never gave up. Most of the black artists who are getting royalties today owe it to Miss Ruth Brown and the fight that she put up against that industry. The same people Kanye was talking about who went after Kanye. Because they said, you may get away from us, but you will not take the money you made being with us. So we're going to take that from you. But I still think Kanye is smarter than they are because he's black. You know? He's going to figure this thing. And I'm sure others are going to come with him. And another beautiful thing that came out of that, I got invited to a meeting called by Curtis Blow. Y'all know who Curtis Blow was. And, and um, KRS went. And about 200 other rappers. Everybody from Melly Mel to you know who. And those brothers that got together, they're forming a hip hop union, a legitimate labor union. Okay, it'll be the biggest labor union in America if they're able to pull it off. And they're trying, they're getting very close with it. Because these young men and women in that industry, people are making billion dollars off of them and they're dying in poverty. 
They're getting old and sick, ain't got no health insurance. They can't even bury one another. After making billions of dollars for that community that Kanye was talking about. And so they've gathered themselves together to fight back. And I believe they're going to be victorious. You know, I know they're going to be victorious. Because I think the generation we have that this young lady here represents is the best generation we've ever produced. They're the smartest. They're the best trained. They're the most politically powerful in the history of white or black America. You ever look at TV? And the news commentators? You see all them black women up there? And people can put them down if they want. Some of them says has got it going on up here and in here for black people. The largest graduating grouping genetically in the world today is black women. More black women are graduating from college than white women. And we are more successful in the areas, professional areas we're graduating from than anybody, white man or white women. That's why you're seeing us all over the place. That's why the question of identity is so important. Because what's happening, other groups are pulling them into their camp. The same white elements from the LGBT to the DDDT and all the other JEWCs are starting to pull them in their camp. And we as a community have to tell them, you got a camp. You got a home base. And we have varieties. But we're working on it, and then we're getting there. So the key is true freedom is being shackled to your identity. True freedom shackled to your identity. And not to be afraid of your history. We're not only from Africa, we're from God. Can't separate the two. We are God having a human experience. That's real. Bring any scientist in the world to disprove it. That's, you cannot disprove that. Okay? So we have to just make sure that our young people learn that ethics and morals and principle are not white qualities. These are African qualities and attributes on how society was formed. And we have to keep ingesting this into our children and into the education system. Black men have to start showing up at PTA meetings and meaning it. Black men have to start showing up at school board meetings and meaning it. Black men and women in the churches, you've got the institution, you've got the building. Set up the classes, the STEM classes, to two days a week for our children, science and math. That's all they need. And one day, an hour out of, or two out of a day to teach them their history. And they will turn this world upside down. We've got the institutions to do it. We've got the facilities to do it in. We need the willpower to take responsibility to save these kids. If they end up on the street shooting somebody, that's our child. We are the one responsible for that shot, not them. We are responsible for that gun in their hand, not them. If they're on the street as a homeless child, a teenager, we are responsible that one of our children is on the street homeless or psychologically damaged and injured and have no place to go but the street. We are responsible for that crime. And we have to start taking responsibilities. The last piece I want to just mention, because there's a big to-do going on in Washington, D.C. All 47 African nations are here in America, meeting with President Biden. But they haven't done the dignity of meeting with them one-on-one -on -one like they do European presidents. 47 African presidents, but there's no steak dinner at the White House. That's crazy. But let me just give you just a couple of stats, and then I'll end this and take some questions. But I heard that the president of Kenya has spoken well on behalf of the African Union. But it has to be more than speaking well. Now, this is the second such conference that America has done. Obama was the, the first one, to his credit, and tried to have a real conversation. But he was just one man. Even though I beat him up every now and then, and he deserves some of my beating, he's just one man. He's like Hakeem Jeffries is going to rise to power, but Hakeem is one man. 
And unless the others support him and we support him, they will not be able to come up with a lot of success. But China has had eight such meetings in the same period of time with African nations, while America's only had two. America has attempted nine coups in Africa just in the last 15 years. Every one of the coup leaders were trained at West Point or in Langley, Virginia, and went back home as military men to the continent of Africa. You all understand the implication of that? The last order Obama gave when he left the presidency was the continued bombing of Somalia. The last order that Biden gave before the African nations arrived last week was the American troops have been authorized to invade it. Somalia. Now, people don't understand because we don't know Somalians very well. We don't know the gold. We don't know the cobalt. We don't know the oil. We don't know the manganese. We don't know the diamonds that those people have. That's what this is all about. It got nothing to do with no jihadists and Islam and all that foolishness they're telling you. This has to do with the wealth in the earth. So, we tried three times to overthrow Burkina Faso, three times to overthrow Mali, one time to overthrow Guinea, one time to overthrow Gambia, one time to overthrow Mauritania. But the key thing, they said they pledged in $55 billion. Well, $55 billion won't fix the stuff that's wrong in Baltimore. Now, how's $55 billion gonna fix 47 nations? But even stronger than that, just let me give you another figure. The, what the, um, what the, the West puts into Africa and they call aid and assistance and loans comes out to one hundred and sixty two billion. What they take out of Africa is two hundred and thirty billion in that same year. So you're not giving Africa anything because you're taking out almost twice as much as you say you're returning. and. and of your back your payments is going to be servicing the debt that you just borrowed on, on some money you can't even put in your own bags. That's what they're talking about even with that 55 billion dollars. That's what we're dealing with. That's what has to change in Africa. And if we don't understand that, understand that Africa have 30% of the world resources of mineral. It has 12% of the oil, 8% of natural gas, 40% of the world's gold, 90% of the chromium and platinum, and you can just go on and on with manganese, with uh, the thing for the cell phone, we got almost 100% of that, there's only one other country that could even touch that. And that's what this discussion is all about. Because we're gonna invite you to be on the G20. Why, so we can rob you right to your face. So we can rob you right across the table from me now. I don't have to rob you in secret. I'm gonna bring you right here and rob you. And then they're offering, I heard that he's going to suggest that he's going to recommend that they sit on the Security Council. And the Security Council has the veto power over everything that the General Assembly does in the United Nations. And there's no African that has a permanent seat on that Security Council. So that would be an advantage. Because if you get the permanent seat, then you have veto power. But then it depends on how many guns is at your head when it's time to make the veto. So we have to, as we watch this discussion going on and all the stuff going on in Washington, we have to consider just those few points I made. You know, China is no better. Now, China is there as our friend, but China does give us a better deal. Okay? Russia is not there as our friend, but they do give us a better deal. And I'll end it's like, see, America coming in, and they'll find the most corrupt person who they've trained in America, who've been in the college in America, they'll overthrow somebody, put them in government, and cut the deal with them knowing they're going to steal all the money because that's their instruction. 
whereas China would come in and try to kind of deal with the government and make sure that the government delivers up to the people. So if you look at some of those contracts China negotiated, you see hospitals being built, roads being built, dams being built, railroads being built, bridges being built. If you look at the contracts that America's negotiated, nothing is being built. And what little gets built is so inferior, it's messed up in three, four years. But we as African American people have to take more onus for what these people are doing in Africa. We have to take some of the onus and speak out against it and let the world know we know what you're doing and it's not by, you're not going to do it in my name. Otherwise, I have something to say about it. So I hope I've at least said something to you. I wanted to deal with that issue of the Christianity and the hiding of our African self. Because how can anybody come and see 60 to 80 million Africans and say, y'all not African? Then some of us get confused and say we're not African. Who would you come? Which part of the movie did you come from? <laughs> but we have to be able to make a stance for our children's sake on their African identity. And you have as much right to say you're an African American as a Yoruba has to say I'm a Yoruba Nigerian. Or as a Ghanaian, Ghanaian man has to say, or Ashanti, say I'm an Ashanti, Ghanaian, and African. You can be African American and African. Someone from Trinidad could be Trinidadian and African. Someone from Jamaica could be Jamaica and African. So why can't the African American be African American and African? Why do people keep playing with our identity issue? Sure. And then we get caught up in our fears and ignorance, and we play with our identity issue. And unless you got an identity that you've agreed upon, you don't have the unity that will allow you to spend $1.8 trillion wisely. We spent $1.8 trillion making Arabs rich last year, Koreans rich last year, Indians rich last year, Jews rich last year, white Catholic rich last year, and on and on. And leaving the African American impoverished in the economic marketplace. The dollar didn't get the turnover twice in our community for the most part. And we have to make some different and better decisions. Look on me. You belong to me, I belong to you. If you don't belong to me, my money don't belong to you. Easy decision to make. Love thyself. You can only love yourself if you know yourself. And one of my good friends, she was my friend at the ancestors, Dora Neale Hurst, says, to be there, you got to do what, brother? You got to go there. But to go there, what do you have to do, sister? You got to know there. Mm. So to be there, you got to go there. But to go there, you got to know there. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, well, we'll do just a few questions because we do have to get out of here. Awesome. Brother, Dr. Well, so we put, we'll, put us, we'll put us out of here tonight because we got some way to go. Tonight, um, but just 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 keep in mind that um, you know this is this is the last lecture of the of the year. We rolled into twenty three. Now we've been getting busy this last few months with bringing y'all different uh, scholars and information here. And you see, this is the headquarters where we're gonna be doing a lot of this stuff. And you know, we've never had sponsorship from anybody. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, besides the black community, we, have, we never had major sponsorship for these lectures at all. I built a relationship for twenty seven years. Most of these lectures, so they'll come for me, and they're gonna make where you know, they, you know, when other folks call, you know, what I'm saying they're gonna, they're gonna give them a certain amount of money, you know what I mean? Like, all right, what you want, what you need, what is, you know, what I mean, and they will come because I have built a report for them all through the year. So, if you can make a donation, it's the last lecture of the year. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, you, you gotta be stingy with it, you can't, you know, what I'm saying, so only a few of us here, you know, what I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, give us, give, give us your Christmas, <laughs> your holiday money, but. You know, you know, give a little something about we going to the other side. You know what I'm saying? So we want to send um, Professor Smalls back. You know what I'm saying? You know, with a few few dollars in his pocket. You know what I mean? Some things that he can have. You know what I mean? So we're gonna be able to you know bless him with that. I know it's a few of us, but some of y'all here might be a millionaire here hiding around. and might got a couple dollars. Say, you know what? I get it. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna write this dollar dollar check here today. You know what I mean? Or how the dollar how the dollar check for fifty dollars, whatever you can get. And if you need a cash app, 
just let me know. Also, the food, the food that's prepared. We had done not done the best, because sometimes we've done lectures and haven't had food. People were acting ridiculous, right? So the last three or four lectures that we've had here, please, please get the food vibe and get your dinner for tonight. Um, for tomorrow, please, you know what I'm saying? Um, go to back to sisters, prepare, prepare food. We want to get rid of that food, you know, so um, please support and buy your food. And then we're going to get up out of here, y'all. But uh, just one or two questions, and then we're going to get ready to get up out of here. Go ahead, first here, bro. Yeah, uh, speaking of Hold the microphone. This one? Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dr. Small. Appreciate your lecture. Uh, you said something about religion. You told uh, something Dr. John had told you in the class. You said, we go, in, we go in the back door of religion, asking the latecomers for permission to enter. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, really quick, and what, what John was saying is like that this thing that's called religion, the way it's uh, constructed today as a business organization and enterprise, that's the piece we miss about most of these churches and mega churches are businesses making millions of dollars. But the parishioners are not getting the advantage. It's not buying insurance for them, it's not paying their hospital bills, it's not taking care of them when the house burned down and these sort of things. And so we're going into an enterprise that someone else has reconstructed. That's what he means by the back door. And I think we ought to, I was trying to tell you to go through the front door knowing that it's yours. Take it back. Take it back from those who have criminalized our, our religious institution. And religion is a tool of spirituality, but I'm not going to go deep in spirituality. Spirituality is the scientific understanding of how the universe and nature works. That's all spirituality is. Spirituality is really a daily reality. Religion is a tool of how you are supposed to enact and teach that to the masses. Amen. 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 Right. My question is, uh, when you talked about your awakening about the African American, uh, what was your study point what was your focus to help you start the study and break the chain? I don't have one of those. I'm, I'm born in that. I'm from the, I'm a free word, I'm N word, is what they used back in the day. That's the, in the Caribbean, you call that the Maroon community. I'm from a place they call today the Burgess in South Carolina. But when I was a child, it was still called the free word. That's the area we dominated from slavery that we ran away to. And that's where the smalls come from. And you'll see us all through the history of South Carolina. That's just at the end of the Civil War. We were free wood Negroes. They used another word to describe them back then. But I'm from both sides of my family is from my own communities. Both sides. And my grandfather was the head of the Prince Hall Lodge. And my grandmother was the head of tents. Just real quick. Um, the woman king, um, the one of the thing was that I'm um, just real quick, uh, feminist agenda or whatever. Oh, that's what, when I heard that discussion, that was the craziest discussion. But I almost got caught in it. I made a statement on one show before I went and watched the movie. So, the next one I got on my bed, first thing I did, I went and watched that movie. It is the most remember, it's a movie, right? It's fiction, but it is fiction that's depicting aspects of our history. That's what most movies are. That's right. But none of them are history unless it's a documentary dedicated to the purpose of being a documentary. That's not what this was. This was a movie showing a facsimile of powerful black women. That the Dahomey Kingdom was involved in slavery some period of time. That's been known throughout history, but most of the history of Dahomey was not involved in slavery. And for that, and what people I see trying to do is acting like that, if you ever look at historical Dahomey, it wasn't big as Baltimore. All right? Now, people want to make it into this big slaving kingdom. That's not true. That's a lie. Most of the history, and Dahomey was responding to Oyam, which was another kingdom that was involved in this process that they were fighting against. So that's why you got to study the history, give it a mystery. The movie itself was about the strength of the black woman. That's not a myth. 
The homie had an army of black women that kicked ass coming and going. No one could beat those sisters. Until the French came in with the Gatling gun. Hmm. And, and, and that's what, you know, in the, that land, I've got the name of the last battle, they killed hundreds of those sisters. But here's the kicker. It was those women, according to Isabel Danto and the Free Haiti Movement, and I trust her research impeccably. The lady who raised Jean-Jacques Dessalines was one of those women. The women who end up giving us the Haitian Revolution was those women who the French put in slavery. The daughter. But we need to study our history. So we'll get out of the mystery. I thought it was Bible of David. I thought it was Bible of David. Anyway, see, jump off of a roof and no cave. All right, I think it's But she and her husband and the other black women who directed that thing. And, and I'm not talking willy nilly because I've been in the movie industry now for only six years, but I've been right at the top of it. You know, for six years, I've been the consultant of the Godfather of Harlem. Okay. And I'm, in the, I'm at every shoot, every day, all day, with the directors, with the executive producers. Every script that gets written, I get to read before it gets to the director. So I got a sense of what you're going to go through to make a piece about your people. When you're trying to fight in another culture, even when they mean well, they cannot interpret our cultural response, even in fiction. As I thought Viola and him did a wonderful job, because my goddaughter, her name is Queen Diambi. You know who Queen Diambi is? Anybody know Queen Diambi? Queen Diambi has taken the throne of Nzenga six years ago. She is the king of the Congo, not the queen, of the Congo, the king of the Congo, the king of the order of the leopards. Nigeria has five female kings right now. So women kings is no anomaly to Africa. Hatshepsut was the king of Egypt. And she was a woman. So Africa having a women king, then you know that's only news for people who don't know. Study history, race mystery, you see all the beautiful women kings of Africa. And we still have them today. But the story was about the integrity of black women. It's about a woman who had been raped and misused. Doesn't matter whether people raped her with black or white. Okay? And she had to go through the same trauma any woman had to go through that kind of rape and misusing do. And being a part of a society where she couldn't even own her baby. And she gave that baby to a friend to dispose of. And that friend saved that baby. And that baby came back to become her best warriors. And then she discovered that this is my baby. Just that story alone, this reunification of this mother and this child. How many times that happened in slavery here in America? So that's not a myth. Many of the scenarios we saw in there, it's not mythology. The young mulatto of Africa who fell in love with the young girl. That's not a myth. Some of our greatest leaders were mulatto. Booker T. Washington had a white father. Let me be the boys. Um, Frederick Douglass. And we can go on. So let's stop playing with our minds. Let's study history. And then we'll see that what they were saying, many of the scenarios were real. It's just mythical in terms of the framework they said. But in that mythical framework, they made reference and an allusion to an African experience that happened in a particular part of Africa. But when you study the history of Benin, it isn't just all about slavery. Because we took on the French like mighty men and women. We just didn't have gun technology. Ashe, Ashe, you want a big round of applause? <laughs> oh, you got one more? Peace, 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 greetings. Um, Dr. Smalls, I just want to say thank you personally. Um, my uh, dissertation topic, uh, um, quantitative research, um, I would say supports um, a lot of what you said today. Uh, my, my dissertation is entitled, Measuring the Relationship of Race-Based Trauma, Black Identity, and Spirituality. So 
Um, I, I really um, appreciate all that you said because there is a lot of confusion on uh, how we identify on various levels, religious, spiritual, um, how we identify what black is, and uh, my research supports a lot of what you said. So thank you again. Thank you. What's funny, you know what? The word post explained me trauma of this coin in Baltimore by myself and Patricia Newton in 1992. We were going to the community college. We were just passing down Hancock. And I was telling the sister about some young women in my class who had been abused. And I was trying to help them. And I was equating the abuse by the black men on them as being imitation of what the white slave owners had been doing and that we had, that had carried over into our culture and we were now doing it to ourselves. And I was calling it the Helsinki, whatever the name. And, and Pastor as well, I'm dealing with some homosexual black men who have been abused and in a counseling program she had. And that's the first time I heard post-traumatic stress. So we then married the two things. Instead of post-traumatic stress, we came up with the term post-slavery trauma syndrome. Mm -hmm. And that's how that word was born in 1992, right here. And other people have written books and other things about it. But Pat and I have been lecturing about it since 1992, trying to describe what you're talking about. Shay, I say. Big round of applause again. <laughs> so don't forget to buy all the food that you can buy. Now, let me just a shout out just real quick. Um, uh, just, a, just a few people here, you know what I'm saying? And one of my good friends, Brother Earl, that's here. You know, I said, uh, Brother Small would support me a lot. This brother been by my side every time I called him, you know what I mean? You know, for moms, I mean, he called every day, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, bro, how you doing? How's everything going? I appreciate this brother, you know, for being him and his queen, for being here and being supportive, you know what I mean? So give him a big round of applause, you know what I mean? For my, he has a business also. He has a pest control business. If he had problems with him, pests or whatever, you know what I'm saying? You know, holler at the brother, he can get your call. Um, also, um, Bobby Issa in the back, you know, I always call him out. Bobby Issa, my, my, my great elder who was grandfather, the uncles, and all that, you know, he still comes to the conscious here, barbershop, and loves to debate all day long, you know, with the brothers, brothers there, we love him, and this brother's been by my side every step of the way, and I, Mr. Dennis that's in the back, right there, there's a bunch of other Dennis's in here, <laughs> Mr. Dennis that's in the back, um, who's the father, who's, who's, who's a, a great brother, he's a, the father of one of my very best friends growing up, and my one of my very first business partners that I've had also, but his son, uh, great brother, he's a football coach, taught me how to play football, taught a lot of people around the neighborhood how to play football, you know what I'm saying? So just want to acknowledge that this brother's here, he's been a major portion, part of my life also, him and his queen is here also, so appreciate them, give them a big round of applause also. So I just wanted to shout those people out, and my little queen, Kamaria, who's 17 now, people don't know, oh my God, this is little Kamaria. You know, she was a baby girl, but she got fucked a couple years ago. My, my three-year-old little, little girl and little Jabari now, you know, so, so now she was the baby girl, now she's the middle child now. <laughs> so, you know, so she's she said that, but, <laughs> but if we could, let's stand for the Harambe's. And don't forget, you don't have to, you've got cash, you can see me, or you can see Kamaria, and if you need the cash app, then I, I can give that out to you, the cash app, if you come to me, you want to give me cash app. All right, let's do that. We're going to close out with the Harambe's. Seven times, that's mean. I mean, let us all pull together in Swahili. All right. We may be having a Kwanzaa celebration um, the 27th. I don't know. We'll, we'll send an email. If I don't have an email, make sure I get your email so we can get you on the email list. All right. So one, two, three. Harambe! 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 Harambe!